Good morning. You made it. That's the good news. Welcome. If you are new here this morning, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. And I heard a story recently about a couple who'd been married for 62 years. Unbelievable. Now, you're probably thinking, how? How did they do it? How did they make it work? Well, one plausible reason is that the husband didn't speak. I'll leave that one right there. Also, he couldn't hear. (laughs) Very helpful. (laughs) I won't elaborate. Well, one day, he was deaf and mute. One day, his wife was on the YouTube, just scrolling some videos. She got tech savvy. She liked to look at the YouTube, and she noticed one particular video that looked like her husband. That's unusual. But it can't be my husband, she thought, because, well, he was singing karaoke. You need to hear and talk in order to do that, don't you? So she took a closer look. He's wearing his favorite shirt. That's my husband. So her first thought was, this must have happened last night. Jesus healed him. This is amazing. And at first she's overjoyed. She's thinking, wow, I can finally hear his voice. This is great. But then she looked at the date of the video. And it was posted over a year ago. Well, that joy soon turned into sorrow. This is pretty, he's been hiding this from me for 62 years. Can you imagine that? Then that sorrow started to turn into anger. This is really elaborate. How could he have kept this up for 60? What kind of person do you have to be to do something like that? She got so mad that she said, fine, I'm going to divorce this guy. I don't care how long we've been in this. I'm done. Right. So, long story short, they get to divorce court, and they're at a hearing. <laughs> anyway, I don't know how all this works, but they're before the judge, and, you know, he's keeping up the act, even though he's caught on tape. So they have a sign language person there for him and everything. And she's just getting more and more angry at this whole situation. How dare he? He's even keeping it up now. So finally, it bubbles up within her, and she just can't help herself. Even though her lawyer just, don't say anything, let me do all the talking. Nope. She bursts out. It took me years to learn sign language for him. Years to communicate with my hands. And as soon as I started getting good at it, he started to pretend he was going blind. (laughs) Today, we are going to talk about about deaf and blind people (laughs) in a biblical context. We find ourselves in the rest of the story. If you're new here, we're just going through the entire Bible. In particular, we're going to look at the things that people don't normally look at in church on a Sunday. And it's interesting how much of it there is, isn't there? Seems like there's more of it we don't read than what we do. And so we're going to do that today with a very famous story. A lot of Christians like this one. It's not as famous as David and Goliath, maybe, but if you've been in church for a while, you've heard this account. So we left off 1 Kings 17. We saw Elijah, and we're getting into this concept here. We did it a little bit with Abraham and Isaac, but we're really going to get heavy on this concept that everything in the Old Testament is a prefigure. It all points to Jesus. That's the appropriate way to be looking at our Bibles. It all points to Jesus, and ultimately, it all points to our eternal life in him. That is our joy. That is our hope. That is where our citizenship is. That's where we belong. That's it. So to do that, to focus in on the small things, and I've been teaching on this, yes, the miracles, they're great, but they're signs. What do signs do? Signs point to something else. Jesus gets very frustrated with everyone when they get stuck on the signs and the miracles. He's like, I'm out. 
Right? So this is the way it still is. We have to focus on our eternal life. And so Elijah prefigured a lot of things. And so we looked at that. If you're new or you missed it, you can go back through the app and you can look at those messages. So now we find ourselves at 1 Kings 18 through 19. So the overlying context, remember, there's the drought caused by Ahab and his wicked wife Jezebel. She introduces all this false worship, and now God is punishing them. A drought can be a really bad thing, even here in southwest Florida. What happens during the wintertime? We don't get a lot of rain. We get fires and things. It causes all these problems. So, you know, they're having like a famine there. This is a really bad, bad thing. So just remember that overlying context here. So now we continue. 1 Kings 18.1, later on, in the third year of the drought, the Lord said to Elijah, go and present yourself to King Ahab. Tell him that I will soon send rain. So Elijah went to appear before Ahab. Meanwhile, the famine had become very severe in Samaria. So Ahab summoned Obadiah, who was in charge of the palace. Obadiah was a devoted follower of the Lord. Once, when Jezebel had tried to kill all the Lord's prophets, Obadiah had hidden 100 of them in two caves. He put 50 prophets in each cave and supplied them with food and water. Ahab said to Obadiah, we must check every spring and valley in the land to see if we can find enough grass to save at least some of my horses and mules. So they divided the land between them. Ahab went one way by himself and Obadiah went the other way. Probably not the same Obadiah as the book of Obadiah, though it's debated, but there's something like 38 Obadiahs in the Bible. So probably not, I'm not saying it is. But anyway, just in case you were wondering. So Obadiah, he's walking along, he sees Elijah. And that's an interesting reaction. He goes up to him and he's like, a lot of respect, bows down low. My Lord, is that you, Elijah? Yeah, it's me. I got a message for Ahab. <laughs> and Obadiah is scared. He's like, no, you're going to get me killed, essentially, is the basic point, if I boil it all down. He's been looking everywhere for you, all over the world. And to everyone who says, I don't know where Elijah is, he basically he makes him prove it. So here's what's going to happen. I'm going to deliver this message for you, and the Spirit of God is going to whisk you away somewhere. It might make you think of Acts chapter 8. Philip, whisk you away somewhere, and then when we can't find you, he's going to kill me. Why would you do that to me? Well, Elijah swears. Nope, I swear by the Lord in whom presence I stand. I'll see Ahab this very day. Makes Obadiah comfortable. He goes and talks to Ahab. Ahab goes out to see Elijah now to meet him. And he levels an accusation. There's the troublemaker of Israel. Elijah flips it. You're the troublemaker. You and your family have brought this upon us through basically your idolatry. So here's the deal. <laughs> and now, and that's the backdrop, a lot of people don't know that. <laughs> but here we get to the famous account that you've probably heard. And Elijah's going to set it up. So we find out that there are 450 prophets of Baal or Baal, or whatever you want to pronounce it like, Baal, and then 400 prophets of Asherah. This is a female fertility goddess. So you have you know, almost an even amount on the female side and male side. And it says that these female or Asherah prophets, they're not necessarily female, they sit at the table of Jezebel. Jezebel is supporting these prophets. But it shifts over to the prophets of Baal. We just kind of in the account forget about the other prophets from Asherah. So, or of Asherah. So Elijah continues, <laughs> and he says, get all of Israel. Let's go up on Mount Carmel here, and we're going to have a contest is what he's going to set up. So bring the prophets with you, everybody. So Ahab summons the prophets of Baal. They go up on Mount Carmel. And now Elijah is going to set up some rules. <laughs> he's going to say it a couple of times, too. He's going to say, get two bulls. And he's going to give them what we would call today home court advantage. All right, we're going to have a contest. Here's what's going to happen. Two bulls, you pick the one you want. We're each going to sacrifice the bull. We're going to build an altar, sacrifice the bull, but don't set fire to it. Whoever's God sets fire to it, well, that's the real God. And if you're reading carefully, he calls their God a lowercase g, and he calls his God the Lord. So he's always saying the Lord, right? The Lord versus their God. So they pick the bull, they start the contest, and he goes, you go first, too. I'll let you go ahead of me. That's fine. There are more of you. He says, I'm the only prophet of the Lord, but you have 450 prophets, right? So this should be easy for you. So 
they begin. They cut up the sacrifice, and they're trying to conjure up their God. And this is what they do. So remember, they have all these weird beliefs, and they're going from about 9 o'clock in the morning to noon. So about four hours, this is going on and on and on. And Elijah had told them already, how much longer will you waver, hobbling between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. So then they continue. They're doing their thing. <laughs> and he begins to mock them. It says around noon, if you're reading a modern translation, you'll have to shout louder, he scoffed, for surely he is God. Perhaps he is daydreaming or relieving himself. Or maybe he's away on a trip or is asleep and needs to be awakened. I want to hit the pause button on that because I've heard certain pastors go on and on about that relieving himself thing. Like, Elijah's the coolest person I have ever heard of. He's in this middle of the thing and he's like, maybe he's going to the bathroom. And it's kind of interesting. But I looked into this very, very, very carefully in the Hebrew and in the Greek and even with my Greek teacher, <laughs> and we came up with this. It's more like maybe he's unable to evaluate. So before you get too excited about that, it may be a bad translation. Here's the thing. These are all very normative things that in ancient times people would do with foreign gods. They would conjure him up. They would awaken him from a sleep. So that's all he's doing. He's using language like that. Like, so there's some mockery there, but it's not quite as exciting as I hoped it would have been. Anyway, <laughs> just so you know, if you know that story and you've heard that version of it, don't hang there too long. So they start going nuts. They're cutting themselves, trying to conjure this God. They're bleeding everywhere. It's this crazy scene, but nothing happens. Not a word, not a sound. No fire. Elijah's turn. So he builds the altar. It says he rebuilds the altar because one of the things that they're doing is they're tear tearing down the altars of the Lord. So he rebuilds the altar. Twelve stones. Each stone represents a tribe of Israel. So he gets it all set up. He digs a trench around it. Says it'll hold about three gallons of water. And here's what he does. So he cuts up the bowl. So he does all that. Then he tells the people, get four large jars of water and soak this thing. Just soak it. Drench it. And he makes them do it three times. Then this is what happened. 1 Kings 18.36. At the usual time for offering the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet walked up to the altar and prayed, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Prove today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. Prove that I have done all this at your command. O oh Lord, answer me. Answer me so these people will know that you, O oh Lord, are God and that you have brought them back to yourself. Immediately, the fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven and burned up the young bull, the wood, the stones, and the dust. It even licked up all the water in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell face down on the ground and cried out, The Lord, He is God. Yes, the Lord is God. So a couple of things to point out there. Prefigures. This is a prefigure of baptism. Read John chapter 3, for example. We're baptized in water and in the Holy Spirit. A symbol, yes, of the Holy Spirit is the dove. Also, fire. And if you know Pentecost in Acts 2, when the Holy Spirit comes down on everyone, it's like what? Flaming tongues of fire licked up the water, it says. Really interesting language, but God's Word is very intentional. So now Elijah says, gather up all these prophets. He takes them out and has them killed. He kills them, all of the prophets. Then this is interesting. Elijah goes to Ahab and he goes, get something to, to, to eat or drink, get some food, for I hear a mighty rainstorm coming. Interesting. So Ahab goes and eats this king, wicked king Ahab. And Elijah, he goes up and he prays. And he gets in a weird kind of posture. He's either kind of like kneeling down, bowing down low with his head like down between his knees, or he's sitting with his feet out in front of him with his head between his knees, kind of a strange posture, and he's praying. He's going to start praying for rain. He sends his servant, and he says, look over the sea. Tell me if you see rain. Nothing. So he goes back and forth seven times. Finally, the seventh time, he sees it. 
He tells him, I see it like a rain cloud, like a hand in the sky looking over the sea. So he goes, go and tell Ahab, get going. Go back to Jezreel. You know, otherwise the rain might stop you is the point. So then Ahab does something kind of interesting. <laughs> he, it says he tucks his cloak in his belt or like old-fashioned language, girds his loins basically. He gets himself ready. And all of a sudden he has this supernatural speed. He becomes the flash, <laughs> and he races to Jezreel, beating Ahab and his chariot there. Pretty incredible. Now, this is where most people stop. They've been in church for a long time. Sometimes it's just the contest on Mount Carmel. That's it. Some people go to the praying, and they come up with different applications, which are all fair, right? So the persistence of prayer, God answering our prayers, God showing up, things like that. All totally fair. But this is the rest of the story. So I'm going to show you there are two sides to this coin. You see, there's more to prayer than that. And there's more to the story than that. We need to keep reading. It wasn't designed so that we stop and then never go to anything else for years and years and years. So here's the rest of that story. Turn the page. Ahab tells Jezebel what he did. So she's going to send word to Elijah. May the God strike me dead if by this time tomorrow I haven't killed you. So Elijah gets afraid. Yes, it says he has fear. He's afraid and so he takes off. He's going to go off to the wilderness, but he drops his servant off at Beersheba, of his town. Well of the Oath is what it's called. And then he heads out to the wilderness. He finds a broom tree and he prays to the Lord. I've had enough. Take my life, Lord, for I'm no better than my ancestors. He wants to die. He falls asleep. But then an angel wakes him up, eats Elijah, and then he sees some bread cooked on a stone in a jug of water. So he eats, drinks, goes back to sleep. Angel comes again. Elijah, eat. You're going to need strength for this journey. It's going to take you 40 days, 40 nights to go to Mount Sinai. So you should be thinking of Moses a little bit. Interesting. So he goes. He's sustained for this journey. He gets to Mount Sinai and he finds a cave. He spends the night in the cave. But the Lord says to him, what are you doing, Elijah? And then he levels his complaint. I have served you zealously, Lord. But the people, they've broken the covenant with you. They've taken on false gods, this idolatry. They've torn down your altars, killed your prophets. I'm the only one left, and they want to kill me too. Here's what happens. 1 Kings 19.11, Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. And Elijah heard it. He wrapped his face in his cloak, and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And a voice said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied again, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. A couple of notes here. If you're really in the Word, this reminded you of what? Exodus 19 and 20, the giving of the law. The same things happen, right? The thunder and fire, the cloud, the earth shaking, people being absolutely terrified, Moses climbing the mountain. He does two cycles of that if you read far enough. He also stands at the foot of the mountain. So it's very similar. Same place, same stuff happening. Interesting. But what's different? You see, with Moses, it's a very consistently loud encounter. Also similarities too. Maybe it's practical. Elijah covers his face with his cloak. Moses has to wear the veil eventually. Very loud encounter with Moses. Right, and so was the first round on Mount Carmel with the fire coming down. But now what happens? God's in a whisper. He's quiet. 
What does he say? Well, so the Lord tells him, go back the same way you came and travel to the wilderness of Damascus. He's going to appoint three people. Haziel of Aram, appoint him, king of Aram. Jehu, grandson, son, or descendant of Nimshi, or yes, Nimshi, the king of Israel. And Elisha, not Elijah, Elisha. This is where it gets a little confusing. Elisha, son of Shaphat, as my prophet. And he basically says, anyone who escapes from one, the other one's going to kill him, to summarize. But I will preserve 7,000 others in Israel who have never bowed down to Baal or kissed him. So they're like kissing the feet of these false gods. Then I'll just summarize for you, you get the calling of Elisha. So remember, Elijah is first, Elisha is second. Elijah sees him, and he's plowing in a field with 12 teams of oxen. He's in charge of the last team. Elijah does something that might seem strange to us. He goes right up to him, and he covers him with his cloak and walks away, putting his mantle on him. Elisha is going to be his successor. Covers him with the cloak, walks away. Elisha clearly knows what it means because he goes up to him, and he says, let me say goodbye to my parents. Okay, that makes me think of Jesus. When he says, let the dead bury the dead, right? Come follow me. Let me say goodbye to my parents. Well, no, let the dead bury the dead, except Elijah seems to be a little bit nicer. He's like, fine, go ahead. <laughs> but think about what I've done to you. That's what he says. So he goes home, and just like kissing the altar of Baal, let me go kiss my mother and father goodbye, he says. Same kind of language. So he does. Then he chops up his animals, the oxen, and he feeds them to the townspeople. This is important because it's kind of like he's committing to this new ministry completely. He gets rid of all his animals. And now it should remind you of the disciples, right? They leave their fishing profession. They, they leave what they're doing and they fully commit to the Lord. Well, he's fully committing to this mantle, this new ministry. That's it. He's getting rid of the animals. There's no going back. He knows what's going on. Paul references this account in Romans. And so we've been talking about this through the series quite a bit, and it's very, very, very important. I've heard people say they're New Testament Christians, or from my observation, and this was me early on in my Christianity, they read the New Testament the most. People generally know like these big stories, like the contest on Mount Carmel, David and Goliath, like the big things, the first few chapters of Genesis, you know, things like that. You know the big stories, but there is so much more as evidenced in this series. We've been in this series for over a year, and it's probably going to be another year, you know, so, but not a bad thing because we're really completely looking at the Word of God. There's nothing wrong with that. It's educating us. And some of you are like light bulbs are going off, but some people will just stick with the New Testament. Here's the problem. There are several problems with that. One, you can't be a New Testament Christian. You can't because about a third of it is Old Testament quotation or reference. So you're reading the Old Testament if you're reading the New Testament. But here's the problem. If you have not read the Old Testament, if you do not understand this story, you don't have the context and you can't understand it completely. We learned that about the Samaritans. A lot of people were like, bing, because the little light bulbs going off over people's heads. Oh, now I get it. Now I understand why. So this will become even deeper and deeper and deeper as we progress. You need to understand the Old Testament in order to understand the new. When Jesus is preaching, when Paul is writing his letters, Peter, James, John, they all expect you, you, the hearers or readers, to understand that story that they reference. Think about it. There's an expectation there that you know. Go through Hebrews. <laughs> Whoever's preaching that gets frustrated. Oh, I want to go on to things about Melchizedek, but you guys are babies. You should be teachers by now. Why is he frustrated? If you read, he's constantly referencing all these Old Testament stuff in rapid succession. He expects everyone to understand what he's talking about. And when you don't, you're lost. That's why a lot of people get lost. You get to Hebrews and like, huh? What is he talking about? Well, if you go through the Old Testament, you won't get lost. You'll go, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, and then it makes sense. Right? So here's Paul. Context for Romans. I've often said, Paul didn't sit down writing Romans and say, I'm going to write the greatest theological work ever written. <laughs> nope. 
It's a simple letter to the church in Rome. Disunity. The Jew, Jewish, now Christians, Gentile Christians. They're butting heads. We're better, we're better, we're better. They're going back and forth. So Paul's just using the really the first 11 chapters to level the playing field before he gets to 12. Okay, therefore, now here's what you do with it. No chapter numbers in the originals did not exist. So not until about 1200 AD, Stephen Langton put them in there. So Archbishop of Canterbury. But anyway, no numbers. And sometimes the numbers mess you up. It'd be good to get like a reader's Bible and just keep reading because people stop and you shouldn't. Chapters 9 through 11, logical question being answered. What happens to all Paul's kinsmen, that is, Jewish people, that did not decide to become Christians, that have rejected Jesus as the Messiah? Has God now rejected them? Paul writes, no. God has not rejected his own people, whom he chose from the very beginning. Do you realize what the scriptures say about this? Elijah, the prophet, complained to God about the people of Israel and said, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. And do you remember God's reply? He said, no, I have 7,000 others who have never bowed down to Baal. It is the same today. For a few of the people of Israel have remained faithful because of God's grace, his undeserved kindness in choosing them. And since it is through God's kindness then it is not only by their good works, for in that case, God's grace would not be what it really is, free and undeserved. So in this, this is the situation. Most of the people of Israel have not found the favor of God they are looking for so earnestly. A few have, the ones God has chosen. But the hearts of the rest were hardened. As the scriptures say, God has put them into a deep sleep. To this day, he has shut their eyes so they do not see, and close their ears, so they do not hear. Does that make more sense now? Probably. Most people jump right over that, and they might go to things about grace or things about being chosen, and we get on this rabbit trail of predestination. But that's not Paul's point here. So we understand this better, right? To those who have their hearts hardened, God will sometimes cause them to be Deaf, so they can't hear. Blind, so they can't see. But Jesus has a cure for that. Jesus heals blind people. We see that in the gospel. Probably the most famous example is John chapter 9. I'll just summarize that for you for the sake of time. They come upon a man who's been born blind. Somehow they know that. He's born blind, a blind beggar. Disciples are like, what sin did he commit or what did his parents do? What, what are the sin of his parents? This is a belief. What did they do that this man would be born blind? Jesus says, no, nope, that wasn't the reason. He's born blind so that God's power or glory can be shown, depending on your translation. He's going to do a miracle. So Jesus does something weird, and we're not going to get stuck on that. <laughs> There's reasoning behind it. Gets a little mud. He spits on it. He makes a little solution. He puts it on the guy's eyes, and he's like, go wash. That's the pool of Siloam. It means scent. Go wash in the pool. The guy washes in the pool. He's healed. Everyone's confused. They're like, uh, is this the same blind beggar? That... Is that the same guy? Yeah, it's me. Well, causes some trouble. <laughs> The religious leaders are going to use it because Jesus worked on the Sabbath by making this mud. And so he's the total sinner for doing that. This can't be from God. He's like, I don't know. I can see now. So they bring in the parents. Is this your son? They're like, yeah, it is. But ask him yourself. He's old enough. They don't, they're scared. They don't want to get in trouble. So they're like, whatever. They throw him right under the bus and they go back and forth. Who was this guy? I don't know. Maybe he's a prophet. They're going back and forth. No, he's a sinner. He's like, look, no one's done this from the beginning of the world. All I know is I was blind, but now I can see. And then he sung Amazing Grace. Nope. So <laughs> they're, going back, they're going back and forth. And finally, they just they kick the guy out of the synagogue. You're a total sinner. Get out. Jesus hears about it. John 9, 35. When Jesus heard what happened, he found the man and asked, do you believe in the Son of Man? The man answered, who is he, sir? I want to believe in him. You have seen him, Jesus said, and he is speaking to you. Yes, Lord, I believe, the man said, and he worshiped Jesus. Then Jesus told him, I entered this world to render judgment. 
to give sight to the blind, and to show those who think they see that they are blind. Some of the Pharisees, so that's the religious leaders there, who were standing nearby, heard him and asked, are you saying we're blind? If you were blind, you wouldn't be guilty, Jesus replied, but you remain guilty because you claim you can see. But there's more. No chapter numbers. So turn the page. <laughs> he just continues here. I tell you the truth. Anyone who sneaks over the wall of a sheepfold rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief and a robber. But the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. After he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them and they follow because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They won't run from him because they don't know his voice. It's about relationship. If we have a relationship with Jesus, we hear him and we recognize his voice. If he is our shepherd, we will listen and follow him. It's about relationship, and the key to any good relationship is heart. We have to love others. We have to love God if we want our relationship to work out. The heart is the key to hearing, and really hearing requires humility, a humble heart. We need to approach our conversation with others, with humility. Have you ever finished a person's sentence for them? You ever done that? And if someone really loves you, what do they say? That's not what I was going to say. <laughs> we assume, right? Oftentimes, if we're being honest, we come to a conversation just really wanting to say something, and that's it. We just have a point we want to make, and basically we're waiting for the person to be done talking so that we can make our point. We're not really listening. But here's the thing. In loving others, we need to be listening. It's important with people, but especially with God. Praying is listening. Sometimes we have a lot of big ideas that we've come up with. We bring them to God. Hey, God, I got this really good idea. Bet you haven't thought of it. Can I have it? Please, please give it to me, right? That's what we do. Oh, I got something real good. God couldn't have possibly thought of this. Please, God, give me this. Not like, please, like, Tell me why I'm going through this. Or what do you have for me, Lord? It's amazing. All this big stuff. And we're asking for it real loudly. But we need to be humble so that we can hear the whispers from the Lord. We need humility. You see, to look for God only in the big things. Right? People go to big churches, think they're, think they're going to get big rewards. Big ministries, popular leaders, of course, of course, they have the bat phone to God. Right? If it's bigger, it's better. As if we go to the conference, right? Because there, we're going to be able to conjure up God like he's Baal. Genie in a bottle. Oh, yeah, I'm going to conjure him up. Maybe he's sleeping. To see God in this way may be to miss him. <laughs> He's always there. Our God is not sleeping. Our God's awake, very much alive. He's in us. Why do we need to go anywhere to be with God? Don't you know that your bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? You're holy. But we always seek him somewhere. Maybe he's there. Maybe he's there. God is often heard gently whispering 
to a humble heart as opposed to a hardened heart. You see, when someone becomes numb to something, they need more stimulation to be satisfied. But if we truly, if we truly love someone, then nothing but their presence is required. And it is the same with God. We often pray loudly and ask for an equal or greater response. That's okay, but we must have humility and the heart to hear the whisper. That's important. It's funny, if you've been here for a while, you know that we really, really value the Word of God here at C3 Church. It's important to us. This, this is our program guide. We don't sub subscribe to anything else. This, it's enough. People are really funny. I see people write all these books with a whole bunch of opinions, right? And I like the commentaries. If you're going to write a book, do a commentary on this about the original languages, the history. That's fine. That's not what I'm talking about. A whole bunch of opinions. And this is the program guide to the church, right? Because this isn't good enough somehow. They'll sell you the programs and you get all the brochures for the program. The Word of God is enough. That's it. I don't have any better ideas than that. And so, this is why I use this. This is the basis for my sermon. It starts here, not with an opinion. And it's really funny because there are basically, basically two types of people that come in through these doors. And it's funny. I can tell when they're not coming back because they'll say something like, well, there's a lot of scriptures. Bye. <laughs> I ain't going to see you again. And here's why that happens. And there's the other people, and I hear these words a lot. Wow, that was refreshing. Ah, you read your Bible. That's why you like it here. You want to hear God's Word. But here's why it happens. As sad as it is, I'll explain this to you. We've talked about the commercial church, the modern church. It is nothing like the early church. Nothing. We are playing church at best compared to the early church. So we at C3, we're trying to get back there, <laughs> step by step. It's difficult. But that's not your big church. That's not your big ministry. It doesn't look like that. I mean, I've been in church where, okay, everybody, in the beginning, let's stand to honor the Word of God. You ever see that happen? Stand up. And at first, you think, wow, this is going to be a problem. It's not, because you're not standing very long. <laughs> Sits you back down, and let me give you 50 minutes of my opinion very little of the Word of God. Honor the Word of God? You don't honor the Word of God by standing. You honor the Word of God by being in it, by listening to Him all the time, constantly. But people are deprogrammed. They're de-Christianed, right? I just want to hear this, this pastor talk a whole bunch about his dog or something. I've done that. <laughs> but What? I know, Jacqueline's getting upset. I'm not going to go there. <laughs> I had to pick on you. <laughs> uh, I'll take a funny complaint once in a while. But they're deprogrammed. They're de-Christianed. That's not what being a Christian is. Christians are like, no, 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 no. Give me the Word of God. I don't want to hear anything else. It's all I want to hear. The Word of God. That's it. Little opinion, fine. Joke, fine. I get it. We're human. But they're like, that was weird. Think about how crazy that is. If someone comes in here and goes, man, you know, you just read a lot of scriptures. Done a Bible study. I just read a whole book of the Bible. <laughs> That's it. We're done. It's enough. They're like, That's strange. Why? Hebrews, I referenced it. You know, it's probably a sermon. That's probably what that is. It's a sermon. That's what scholars say. It's a sermon. It's just a whole bunch of the Word of God. Rapid fire. We're going at it. Soak it up, man. This is the Word of God. This is unbelievable. So when people come in and they're like, huh? Yeah, I know it's not culturally normative because, well, we're Christians. We're not supposed to be culturally normative. We're supposed to be citizens of the kingdom of heaven. That's different. So it should be different. It breaks my heart because what they're really saying is, hey, pastor, I'd really like to hear more of you than God. What? 
It breaks my heart. It should not be that way. But it is. These people have hardened hearts. And Jesus' solution for that, if you don't know, is kind of surprising. It sounds mean. It says that he taught in parables, riddles, so that the mystery of the kingdom of God would be hidden from those with the wrong heart. So that having eyes, they'd be blind. Having ears, they'd be deaf to it. He doesn't want people there with the wrong heart. We looked at the feeding of the 5,000. Right? And if you look at John's account, what does he do? They keep following him. Ooh, we want more of the miracles and the signs. He's like, you know what? Eat my flesh, drink my blood, go away. And they do. Just the disciples left. And he says, you too? Talked about that last week. Not codependent. Not interested in building a big church. Oh, if you don't like it, too bad. Parable of the sower, real quick. A lot of you know it. It's really important because it's really the initiation of Jesus' parables. It sets the tone. Basically, Jesus is saying, look, I'm going to say all these great things here. It's the Word of God. I'm the Word of God. But here's what's going to happen, guys. It's based on the heart that people are going to receive it. So I'll explain to you both halves. Keep in mind, Jesus does not. And it sounds really weird. So... Farmer, scattering seed. Some of the seed falls on a footpath. That's all he says about it. The bird comes and snatches it up. You've got to put three versions together. Matthew 13, Mark 4, Luke 8. They tell you slightly different details. That's okay. But that's essentially the point. But in Luke, he says the seed is the word of God. So that's what's being spread here. Falls on rocks. Can't get any root. Bird, representing Satan, snatches it away from them. Okay, rocky soil. Can't get a really deep root, so when it comes up, it gets scorched, it gets burned up, or it falls away due to problems. No deep roots there. Okay, some falls along, like around the thorn bushes or within thorn bushes. They represent wealth and all the worries and things of the world. Chokes it out, can't really produce any fruit. But, but, some lands in the fertile soil, gets nice deep root, grows up, produces 30, 60, 100 times the fruit. These are heart conditions. Now, he doesn't explain it to anybody. He leaves out all the explanations I gave, drops the mic. That's it. Bye. So the disciples, later, they ask him privately, what does this mean? Matthew 13, 11, he replied, you are permitted to understand the secrets, mysteries in Greek, of the kingdom of heaven, but others are not. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given, and they will have an abundance of knowledge. But for those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. That is why I use these parables. For they look, but they don't really see. They hear, but they don't really understand, or listen and understand. This fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah that says, when you hear what I say, you will not understand. When you see what I do, you will not comprehend. For the hearts of these people are hardened, and their ears cannot hear. And they have closed their eyes, so their eyes cannot see. Their ears cannot hear, and their hearts cannot understand. And they cannot turn to me and let me heal them. Quoting Isaiah, the Old Testament's kind of important. As we read the word, we must approach it with the right heart and the right intentions, applying it to ourselves with humility. It's only by the power of the Holy Spirit who caused this to happen, to create a clean heart within us so that we can be fertile soil. Our hearts must be fertile for the word in order to hear it. We are never, never alone. God is always there. We just need to listen. God speaks more frequently in persistent whispers than in shouts, and perhaps less in the crowded conference, perhaps less in the crowded church, but definitely more in your Bible, perhaps sitting quietly on the shelf. 
Hearing requires a humble heart. And so as I pray for you, I'll begin with a psalm. Psalm 51.10, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. From the psalmist to now, we have the Holy Spirit of God within us. So Lord, renew us. Create a clean heart within us so that we can hear your instructions clearly. I pray for everyone that you motivate them to dig into the word so readily available to us. It's beautiful. I pray that their eyes are open to your word so they can see, so they can hear, they can know you more deeply, bringing us into a deeper relationship and love of you so that we can love others. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.